Hello students, this is a lecture on chapters 6 and 7 of your Head and Neck Anatomy course. The external nose is composed of the bridge, the dorsum, the ala, the nostrils, and the columella nasi. The bridge of the nose is a surface that is formed by the nasal bones and the dorsum of the nose is the external midline surface of the nose. The ala are the parts of the nose that you can flare out. The nostril is the opening into the nasal passage and the columella is the portion of soft tissue that separates the right from the left nostrils. The nose is formed by the maxillary bone and the nasal bone. The anterior opening is called the piriform aperture and the posterior opening is the coena. The nose is surrounded by or in contact with the cranial cavity, the orbit, the maxillary sinus, the oral cavity, and the nasopharynx. The roof of the nasal cavity is made up of the cribiform plate of the ethmoid bone and the floor is made up by the hard palate. The lateral wall of the nasal cavity contains the superior, middle, and inferior coena and the medial pterygoid plate of the sphenoid bone. The structures that form the nasal septum are the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone, the vomer, and the septal or nasal cartilage. The nasal meatus is a passageway through the nose. The air has to go past the coena where the air is cleansed and humidified as it spins or whirls through the spaces. Also, the paranasal sinuses and the lacrimal duct drain into the meatuses. This image shows the frontal sinus, which is located in the frontal bone, and the maxillary sinus, which is located in the maxilla. Nerves that innervate the maxillary teeth are located in the anterior wall of the maxillary sinus. Therefore, pain from maxillary sinus infections can be referred to the maxillary teeth. The space above the superior concha is the recess into which the sphenoid sinus empties. The middle nasal meatus is where the emptying occurs for the frontal sinus, the anterior and middle ethmoidal sinus, and the maxillary sinus. The nasolacrimal duct empties into the inferior nasal meatus. The muscles of mastication are the temporalis, medial and lateral pterygoids, and the masseter. They are all innervated by the mandibular nerve. These are the major muscles of mastication. The temporal fossa contains the temporalis muscle. The infratemporal fossa contains the medial and lateral pterygoid muscles and the temporomandibular joint. The masseter muscle is located on the lateral surface of the ramus of the mandible. The temporalis muscle originates from the temporal region of the temporal bone and the temporalis fascia and inserts on the coronoid process and the anterior border of the ramus of the mandible. It acts to elevate and retrude the jaw. 
if you observe the direction of the muscle bands in the temporal muscle, you can see that some bands run anterior posteriorly and some run superiorly. The posterior diagonal bands of the muscle retrudes the mandible and pulls it backward. The vertical bands of muscle elevate the mandible and close it. The masseter muscle originates from the zygomatic arch. It has a superficial head, which contains diagonal fibers, and a deep head, which has vertical fibers. The vertical fibers retrude the jaw, while the deep head are powerful elevators of the mandible, which close the jaw. The masseter muscle inserts on the mandible. Its action is to elevate and retrude the jaw. It is innervated by the mandibular nerve. You will notice on patients who brux or grind their teeth that they will have very large masseter muscles. The lateral pterygoid muscle consists of a superior and inferior head. The superior head originates from the sphenoid bone and the inferior head originates on the lateral surface of the lateral pterygoid plate. It inserts on the capsule and disc of the temporomandibular joint. Its action is to depress and protrude the jaw. The lateral pterygoid muscle is the only muscle of mastication that opens the jaw. It is also innervated by the mandibular nerve. The medial pterygoid muscle is made up of a superficial and a deep head. The superficial head originates from the maxillary tuberosity and the deep head originates from the medial surface of the lateral pterygoid plate. It inserts on the ramus of the mandible. It, its action is to elevate and protrude the jaw. In this posterior view of the skull, you can see that the origin of both pterygoid muscles is from the lateral pterygoid plate. The lateral pterygoid muscle arises from the lateral surface of the lateral pterygoid plate and the medial pterygoid muscle arises from the medial surface of the lateral pterygoid plate, not the medial pterygoid plate. The muscles were named for their origins from the surfaces of the lateral pterygoid plate. There are secondary or accessory muscles of mastication that assist in chewing. Most of them are not innervated by the mandibular nerve. These include the buccinator, the digastric, the mylohyoid, and the geniohyoid. The buccinator muscle is a muscle of facial expression and it helps to keep the food in the oral cavity while chewing. The digastric muscles are actually muscles of the neck and they assist in depression of the jaw. The buccinator muscle is innervated by the facial nerve or cranial nerve 7. The anterior belly of the digastric is innervated by the mandibular nerve, while the posterior belly is innervated by the facial nerve. The mylohyoid and geniohyoid muscles are bo both muscles of the floor of the mouth. The mylohyoid depresses the mandible and is innervated by the mandibular nerve. The geniohyoid also depresses the mandible but is innervated by spinal nerve C1 of the cervical plexus. This image shows the buccinator muscle in relation to the masseter and temporalis muscle as well as the parotid gland and Stenson's duct. In the temporomandibular joint, or TMJ, the condyle of the mandible articulates with the temporal bone. 
The articular eminence is the anterior sloping surface of the mandibular fossa on which the mandible glides during opening of the mouth. Opening of the mouth requires two movements, hinging, which partially opens the jaw, and gliding, which slides the mandibular condyle forward over the articular eminence. These two movements are also referred to as rotation and translation. As in other synovial joints, the TMJ is enclosed by an articular capsule. A thickening on the lateral surface of the articular capsule is known as the lateral temporomandibular ligament. The TMJ is stabilized by the sphenomandibular and stylomandibular ligaments. In this sag sagittal section of the TMJ, one can see the external acoustic meatus, the retrodiscal pad which contains blood vessels and nerves, the biconcave articular disc is shown in purple, and the space below the articular disc is called the lower joint space, while the space above the articular disc is called the upper joint space. You can see the superior belly of the lateral pterygoid muscle attaching to the articular disc. The muscles have varying orientation to their fibers that allows for retrusion of the jaw and closing of the jaw. These images show the position of the condyle in a closed and open mouth. When the mouth is closed, the condyle is located in the fossa. When the mouth is open, the condyle and disc are pulled onto the surface of the articular eminence. Note that the articular disc is thick anteriorly and posteriorly. This thickened posterior portion helps to stabilize the joint when the person is chewing on one side of their mouth. This concludes this lecture on chapter 6 and 7 of Head and Neck Anatomy.